One of the things that you view, for example, when you're looking at post-traumatic stress disorder is that it's almost always the case that someone who suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, which you might think of as a real real life reincarnation of the fall is that people encounter something malevolent and it breaks them because it's the worst thing to understand it's like suffering is one thing man that's that's bad enough vulnerability and suffering that's bad enough but to encounter someone who wishes that upon you and will work to bring it about that's a whole different category of horrible especially when it also reflects something back to you about yourself because if someone else can do that to you and they're human, that means that you partake of the same essence. Strangely enough, that's actually the cure to some degree to post-traumatic stress disorder. Is that, like if you've been victimized, you're naive and you've been victimized, the way out of that is to no longer be naive and to no longer be victimized. And that means that you, you see this reflected in the Harry Potter idea, for example, that the reason that Harry Potter can withstand Voldemort is because he's got a piece of him. Or right? he's been touched by it. And the way that you the way that you keep the psychopaths at bay is to develop the inner psychopath so that you know one when you see one, right? And then, but that's a voluntary thing. It's, 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 so it's like, a, it's like a, a set of tools that you have at your disposal, which is full knowledge of evil. And that does, Nietzsche said, if you look into an abyss for too long, you risk having the abyss gaze back into you, right? The idea is that if you look at something monstrous, you have a tendency to turn into a monster. And people are often very afraid of looking at monstrous things exactly for that reason. And then the question is, well, should you turn into a monster? And the answer to that is, yes, you should. But you should do it voluntarily and not accidentally. And you should do it with the good in mind, rather than falling prey to it by possession, essentially, because that's the alternative. Now, how does it possess you? That's easy. Your suffering makes you bitter. Your bitterness makes you resentful. Your resentment means, makes you vengeful. And once you're on that road, you go down that a little bit farther, man. Well, you end up fantasizing in your basement about shooting up the local high school and then killing yourself, right? Because that's sort of the ultimate end of that line of pathological reasoning. Being should be eradicated because of its intrinsic evil, and I'm exactly the person to do it, and I'll cap it off with an indication of my own lack of worth just to hammer the point home, right? And if I can garner a little post, post posthumous fame along the way, well, that'll satisfy my primordial primate dominance hierarchy uh, imaginings too, at least in fantasy. So, you know, it's the full package if you want to go down that route. And, of course, people don't like to think about that sort of thing, and it's no bloody wonder. But w without the capability for mayhem, you're a, you're, you're, a, you're a potential victim to mayhem. So you need your sword. It should be sheathed, but you need to have it. And it's very frequently the case. If you treat someone with post-traumatic stress disorder, the there's two things you have to do. You have to help them develop a very articulated philosophy of evil because otherwise their brain bothers them over and over and over. Why were you so naive? How did you become victimized? Why were you such a sucker? These are good questions. You don't want to have that happen to you again. You don't want to be exploited twice. Okay, so your eyes have to open up. We know the price of that from the Egyptian myth, right? You come into contact with Seth. What happens? Even if you're a god, you lose an eye. It's no joke, man. It's no joke, and then the cure for that is the movement down into the underworld and re the revitalization of the father. That's the identification with the force that created culture, right? And that then there's you and that together. Then you can withstand malevolence. Maybe you can withstand tragedy and malevolence. And then that's the whole secret, right? Because that's what you want in life. You need to be able to withstand tragedy, and you need to be able to withstand malevolence. Because those are the forces that are always working against you. And so it's a, this is associated with the Jungian idea of incorporation of the shadow, right? You have to be, we know this, God, we know how predators work with regards to children even. If you're a pedophilic predator and you're looking at a landscape of children, the child that you're going to go after is the one that's timid and won't fight back. You pick your victim. And predatory people in general are exactly like that, man. They're, because they're predators. They're not going to attack someone who's, who's going to fight back. In fact, the issue is likely not to even come up. They're going to be looking for someone, one way or another, that cannot conceptualize what they are. And then, perfect. It's, a, it's an open season, man. It's open season. And so if you're treating someone with post-traumatic stress disorder, 
First, they need an introduction to the philosophy of malevolence, and second, they have to learn to become dangerous, because that's the only way out. What's the alternative? They get these recurrent thoughts about their vulnerability in the face of malevolence and their own naivety, because by definition, if someone psychopathic has exploited you, you're too naive. It's, it's a definitional issue. You can say, well, that's no fault of mine. How the hell could I be prepared? Fair enough, man. A perfectly reasonable objection doesn't solve your problem. Because it's an, it's an eternal problem, right? The internal problem is, how do you deal with tragedy and malevolence? And you can say, well, I'm not prepared. It's like, yeah, fair enough. Unsurprising, especially if you were overprotected as a child. It's not a good idea to overprotect your kids, because the snakes are going to come into the garden, no matter what you do. And so then you, instead of trying to keep the damn snakes away, what you do is you arm your child with something that can help them chop them into pieces and make the world out of them. So that the, the trick for human thriving in the face of suffering and malevolence is strength, not protection. It's a completely different idea. We also know this clinically. We know, for example, that if you treat people with exposure therapy for agoraphobia, which is roughly speaking the fear of chaos, I would say, the fear of everything, you don't make them less afraid. You make them braver. It's not the same thing, because with an agoraphobic, see, what happens to them is, is the fall. They never conceptualize death and suffering. They're naive, right? It, it never enters their, the theater of their imagination, and it's because they're protected from it. But then something happens. This, this often happens to women in their 40s, because they're, they're the people most likely to develop agoraphobia. Something happens, they're, they've been protected from chaos by authority their entire life. So maybe they had an overprotective father, and then they went to an overprotective boyfriend, and then they went to an overprotective husband. And maybe they were willing to be subjugated to all three of those because of the protection, right? So, so that's the bargain. They, they stay weak and dependent, and maybe they have to because that's the only way they can appeal to the person who's hyper-protective, but the price they pay for that is that they're not sufficiently competent. And then something happens in their life, often in their 40s, they develop heart palpitations, maybe as a consequence of menopause, their heart starts to beat erratically and they think, oh no, death. It's like, well, who are you going to talk to about that? Right? There's no protection from authority for that. Or maybe their friend gets divorced, or maybe their sister dies, or something like that. It brings up the specter of mortality and maybe the specter of malevolence and mortality, and it brings it up in a way that authority, recourse to authority, cannot solve. And so then they have panic attacks. What happens? They go out, they get afraid, they feel their heart beating, then they get afraid of their heart beating because they think, oh no, I'm going to die, and they think, oh no, I'm going to die, and I'm going to make a fool of myself while I'm doing it and attract a lot of attention. So the two big fears come up, mortality and social judgment. And then they have a panic attack, it's like fight or flight's gone out of control. Very, very unpleasant. Then they start to avoid the places they've had a panic attack. Then they end up not being able to go anywhere. So then Tiamat has come back, right? A huge monster, a little victim. And so what do you do with them? Well, you, there's no saying, no, there's no Tiamat. That's done, right? Their naivety is over. They, they've had a direct contact with the threat of mortality and social judgment. They've met the terrible mother, and they've met the terrible father. And there's no going back. There's no saying, oh, the world is safe. It's not safe. Not at all. It's not safe. The fact that you think it's safe means that you were living in an unconscious bubble that was sort of provided to you by your culture. It's a gift. And now that's been shattered. And so now what do you do? Well, the answer is you retreat until you're in your house and there's nowhere you can go. You're the ultimate frozen rabbit, right? And your life is hell because you can't function. The alternative is, let's take apart the things you're afraid of. Let's expose you to them, you know, carefully and programmatically. And then you'll learn that you can, you're actually tougher than you think. You never knew that. And maybe you didn't want to take on the responsibility, because, you know, people play a role in their own demise, so to speak. When you had opportunity to go out and explore or withdraw because you were afraid, you chose to withdraw because you were afraid. So it's not only that you were overprotected often, it's that you were willing to take advantage of the fact that you were overprotected and run back there whenever you had the opportunity. You know, so maybe you're a kid in the playground, right, and you're having some trouble with other kids, and you know in the back of your mind, I should deal, this with, deal with this myself, but you go and tell your mom and get her to intervene. 
And you know that that's not right. You know that you're breaking the social contract. But it's easier. And so that's what you do. You run off to an authority figure and hide behind the great father, right? roughly speaking. Well, the problem with that is you don't learn how to do it yourself. So then you have to relearn it painfully when you're 40. So then you take people out. You say, well, what are you afraid of? Rank it from 1 to 10. So 10 is, we'll make a list of 10 things you're afraid of. The least, the thing you're least afraid of, we'll call number 10. So we'll start with that. Okay, well, I'm afraid of elevators. Okay, well, let's, let's look at a picture of an elevator. Let's have you imagine being in an elevator. Let's go out to an elevator and let you watch the terrible jaws of death open, because that's how you're responding to it symbolically. Right? And you're going to do that at, at the, the closest proximity you can manage. You find out you go do that, it works. You're nervous as hell, especially an, from an anticipatory perspective. Shaking. You go out, you stop, you watch it happen, and you actually calm down. You do that ten times and it no longer bothers you. Well, what you've learned that you didn't die. But more importantly than that, you've learned that you could withstand the threat of death. That's what you've learned. And then you move a little closer, and then you move a little closer, and then you move a little closer, and finally you're back in what's no longer the elevator from a symbolic perspective. It's a tomb, right? It's, it's, it's a place of enclosure and isolation. And you learn, hmm, turns out I can withstand that. And then you're met much more together, much more confident. And that's often one of the things that often happens in situations like that. I've seen this multiple times, is that if you run someone through an exposure training process like that and, and toughen them up, they'll often start standing up to people around them in a way they never did before, because they wouldn't stand up for themselves before, because they weren't willing to undermine the protection. See, if you're protecting me, I can't bother you, because I can't afford to forsake your protection. So if I'm going to play that game, I'm going to be hi hide behind you, then I can't challenge you. So that's no good, because that's sometimes why people, you see this with guys very frequently, they're still deathly afraid of their father's judgment when they're in their 30s or 40s. It's like, well, why? Because well, they still want to believe that there's someone out there that knows. And so they're willing to accept the subjugation, because it doesn't force them to challenge the idea that there's someone out there that knows. Because that's the advantage of having your father as a judge, right? Because he knows. Well, what if he doesn't? What if no one knows any better than you? Well, that's a rough thing. You don't, until you realize that, you're not an adult, right? That's really technically the point of realization of adulthood, is that no one actually knows what you should do more than you do. I mean, it's a horrible realization, because what the hell do you know? It's a terrible realization, and people will often pick slavery, permanent slavery, to the spirit of the Great Father, let's say, over that realization, and it's completely understandable. But the problem with it is, is that there's more to you than you think, and so if you continue to hide behind that figure, then you never have a chance to understand that there's more to you than you think, far more to you than you think. Maybe there's enough to you so that you can actually withstand the threat of mortality without collapsing. Maybe even withstand the threat of malevolence without collapsing. Who knows? It's certainly possible. And it's not an abstract question. It's exactly the sort of question that you address in the psychotherapeutic process. It's, it's always the question that you address. And the answer is often in the affirmative. Because people can get unbelievably tough. And you know that, because people work in emergency wards and hospitals, right? Or they work in, in uh, palliative care wards, or they work as mortuary assistants. I mean, these people have bloody rough jobs. You know, or they're on the front line of police investigation into, you know, heinous child abuse crimes, and so they're confronting malevolence on a regular basis. And, you know, those are very stressful jobs, but people do them. And, and some people do them without even being damaged by them. Although that's a harder thing, because you can see horrible things, you know, things you'll never forget.